Dear friends, do you know how the gospel entered China? Do you know how many missionaries lived in China? Do you know what pushed them forward? Do you know the hearts beating inside them as they sacrificed themselves one after another? Do you know what they actually did in this foreign land and what it means to you? Today, they will tell us. In 1724, Emperor Yong Jun passed an edict to deport missionaries, closing China's doors and beginning a stagnant time of peace and prosperity. Soon after, the Western Industrial Revolution burst onto the scene. Producing textile machines, steam engines, aircraft, electric power, telecommunications, and railroads. Within a few decades, human civilization entered a new era. Back in isolated China, still relishing in its self-sufficient economy, society was filled with deep-rooted problems, manifesting themselves through superstition, foot-binding, opium, concubines, abandoned babies, imperial examinations, and more. Facing such an ignorant, vast, and distant virgin land, some of the West found it mysterious, some reacted with disdain, and some discovered business opportunities. Christians, however, saw the thirst of 400 million souls and the call of God's love. In 1799, as the missionary movement was rapidly expanding in Britain, Robert Morrison was moved by a desire to minister overseas. Eight years later, in 1807, this shoemaker's son from Newcastle was chosen by the London Missionary Society to become the first Protestant missionary in China. And so by the time that Morrison was becoming sort of conscious of life, he was affected by this new spirit. There was a, an awakening of Christianity within England. With that, there was a growing sense of uh, passion to take the gospel. At the time, travel was beginning to open up. Uh, sea travel was becoming easier. Rail travel was just beginning. And Morrison was at one of those great uh, cultural, uh, intellectual, uh, entrepreneurial moments. It was a turning point in British society, much as we see in many parts of the world now. That was the moment, and Morrison was born into that world. At the young age of 25, Morrison cried as he left London. He wrote, I am alone. Oh, that I may not be alone, but that the good hand of my God may be upon me, and the angel of his presence go before me. He was the first one. He felt that God had called him. 
He himself was very uneasy. So after he got on the ship, when someone sarcastically asked, do you really expect to make an impression on the idolatry of the great Chinese empire and lead them to Christ? Morrison was initially taken aback, replying quietly, no, sir, but I believe God will. September in Guangzhou was scorching hot, but Morrison's living conditions were cold as frost. The Qing dynasty had closed its doors for 50 years and prohibited Christianity for a full century. Guangzhou was the only port where foreign trade was allowed, and the activities of foreigners were limited to a small area just north of the Pearl River called the 13 Factories. Morrison's first challenge was learning Chinese. At the time, it was illegal for foreigners to learn Chinese. Any Chinese citizen teaching foreigners Chinese would be tried for treason. Morrison, at high cost, hired a fearless Chinese teacher. This teacher carried poison and was prepared to commit suicide upon discovery in order to avoid being tortured. To protect him, Morrison took lessons at night. The cost of living and his education in Guangzhou were very high. Morrison lived in a room in the basement of a warehouse, ate two meals a day, and eventually suffered from severe malnutrition. He also suffered from loneliness. He sent out 200 letters in one year, only to receive two responses. He said, I felt about this time somewhat depressed on account of my being quite alone, without any person whom I could call a friend. God was his only support. To encourage himself, he wrote in his diary, Be strong in the Lord, O my soul. Fear not, only believe. The firm faith gave him tenacious perseverance. Two years later, Morrison could read the four books, a set of authoritative Confucian classics. He spoke both Mandarin and Cantonese fluently. In order to reside in China legally, he accepted a translator post with the East India Company while laboring over a Chinese-English dictionary and, in his spare time, working on a translation of the Bible. Early on, some people misunderstood Morrison because he was a translator for the East India Company. But the East India Company was engaged in trade with China, which later became the sale of opium. So people say, look, this first Protestant missionary is basically involved in the imperialist culture invasion of China. This terrible East Indian Company translator selling opium to China. So the evidence is irrefutable. But at the time, the Qing government had closed off China to foreigners unless you were there for business reasons. In other words, unless you were an employee of the East India Company, there was no way to enter mainland China. Morrison abhorred the smuggling of opium by the East India Company. He wrote, This is a traffic which is far from being reputable, either to the English flag or the character of Christendom. During this period, Morrison was faced with desperate loneliness internally and endless trials externally. Together, these forces almost crushed this lone pioneer. In 1813, things finally started to turn around. Morrison married Mary Morton in Macau. At the same time, another British missionary couple, the Milnes, came to assist him. In 1814, seven years after his arrival in China, Morrison's first seed finally sprouted through this tough, hard land. On July 16th, Chai Gao, a worker who had been secretly helping with the printing of the Bible, was baptized in Macau, becoming China's first Protestant. Not long after, Chai Gao's brothers, Chai Xing and Chai San, were also baptized. In 1818, Morrison and Milne established the Anglo-Chinese College in Malacca, setting a precedent for the dissemination of Western education to China. On 
November 25, 1819, Morrison and Mill notified the London Missionary Society that they had completed the translation of all books in the Bible. Morrison had spent 12 years and three months translating the Bible. He wrote, I know that the labors of God's servants in the gloom of a dungeon have illumined succeeding ages, and I am cheered by the hope that my labors in my present confinement will be of some service in the diffusion of divine truth amongst the millions of China. There was a great fire in Canton in 1820. He saw his Chinese uh, neighbors showing what he saw to be complete disregard for anybody who lived around them. And that inspired him, this is the good news, to begin to think about ways he could bring in love into the way the Chinese understood the Christian faith and practical love. Very much like Wilberforce, a very clear sense of parallel. The gospel needs to be embodied, not just proclaimed. In 1820, Morrison and Dr. John Livingston founded the first public dispensary in China to help the poor. This was a precursor to the Canton Pak Sai Hospital. In 1821, the Morrison Chapel was established in Macau. This is China's earliest Protestant church. It still stands right next to the old Protestant cemetery where the Morrisons are buried. He preached many sermons, which are hugely fascinating. One of the notes you get out of that is that God loves the world. He doesn't just love the church. And he doesn't segregate. He doesn't differentiate between cultures and languages and colors and things. He loves the world. He loves people. And that was one of the great messages that Morrison brought. And he said, we shouldn't go to China to try and change the culture. We shouldn't go to China and say we're better than China. We go to love China. In 1823, Morrison completed the compilation of his dictionary titled A Dictionary of the Chinese Language. This was China's first Chinese-English dictionary, totaling 4,595 pages. Its publication was of monumental importance to Western studies of China. In the same year, Morrison ordained China's first Protestant minister, Liang Fa, Liang evangelized for 40 years, enduring imprisonment and torture, all the while remaining loyal to his faith. Morrison brought many firsts to the Chinese church and Chinese society. Beneath every little accomplishment, however, lied unimaginable sacrifices. In 1819, half a year before the completion of the Chinese translation of the Bible, Milne's wife, Rachel, after losing two children, also died from illness. Two years later, Morrison's wife, Mary, died of cholera. 29-year-old Mary was pregnant. Morrison was overcome with grief. He wrote, I will not say grieve not, oh no. I have shed many tears for Mary. Let us shed many tears of affectionate remembrance, for she was worthy of our love. Morrison placed his two surviving children under the care of friends and returned back to Guangzhou alone. In some of the unpublished letters that I read, there's some little handwritten notes from Morrison 
And he would end with sort of papa or dada to his children. And you suddenly think, here is a man who, to all the world, was this incredibly gruff, hard-edged, extraordinarily capable, incredibly single-minded person, but actually had a very soft side. Less than two years later, Morrison's only companion, Milne, suddenly died after continuously overworking at the age of 37. Morrison wrote, nine years ago, Mr. and Mrs. Milne were received at Macau by me and Mrs. Morrison. Three of the four, all under 40, have been called hence and have left me alone and disconsolate. But good is the will of the Lord. They all died in the faith and hope of the gospel. All died at their post. Happy am I that none of them deserted it. During this period, at Morrison's request, many churches prayed for him, asking for God to be gracious to him, to be gracious to the Chinese people, to extend the years of the world's only missionary, fluent and proficient in Chinese. After Milne's death, Morrison continued to evangelize in China for 11 years. On July 30th, 1834, Morrison, who had suffered from chronic headaches, fell ill in Guangzhou. He died the night of August 1st at the age of 52. Morrison's body was escorted by his eldest son, John Robert Morrison, to Macau, where he was buried beside his wife, Mary. Morrison was in China for 27 years during the most difficult phase of breaking new ground for the Chinese Protestant Church. Only 10 Chinese locals were baptized. One year after Morrison passed away, his son John and pastor Elijah Bridgman co-wrote a letter reporting that the first Chinese Protestant Church had been established in Guangzhou with 12 members in total. Six years after Morrison's death in 1840, the Opium War broke out. Relentless gunfire blew open China's door. On August 29, 1842, China and the United Kingdom signed the Treaty of Nanking, opening, in addition to Guangzhou, the ports of Xiamen, Fuzhou, Ningbo, and Shanghai to trade. Afterwards, China also signed similar treaties with America and France, including the Treaty of Wangxia, the Treaty of Huangpo, the Treaty of Tianqin, the Convention of Peking, etc. Every treaty had a provision allowing Western missionaries to enter China through these trading ports. Those entering China around this time included Walter Medhurst, the first missionary to reach Shanghai, founder of China's first letterpress magazine, News from All Lands. Samuel Dyer, father-in-law to Hudson Taylor, created a steel typeface of 3,000 Chinese characters, the best of its time. Elijah Bridgman, the first American missionary to China, translated for Chinese official Lin Zashu and participated in the formulation of the Treaty of Wangxia. In 1854, he set forth to investigate whether the Taiping Heavenly Kingdom was in agreement with Christianity. His answer was no. Karl Gutzlaff, the first missionary to reach inland China, distinguished scholar and author of 61 Chinese works. He participated in the formulation of the Treaty of Nanking. Samuel Williams, missionary, diplomat, and sinologist, he wrote The Middle Kingdom, widely considered a pioneering work in American studies of China. He participated in the formulation of the Treaty of Tianqin. 
Peter Parker, the first medical missionary in China. He founded the Canton Ophthalmic Hospital. He also served as a U.S. ambassador to China. Isakar Roberts, who led a congregation of lepers in China. In 1847, leader of the Taiping Heavenly Kingdom, Hung Shu Xuan, requested to be baptized in Roberts' church in Guangzhou. Roberts refused. In 1854, James Hudson Taylor came to China, driving the gospel from the coasts further inland. At the age of 17, Taylor committed himself to becoming a missionary. After four years of medical and physical training, he left his family at 21 embarking on a 156-day voyage before arriving in Shanghai. He rented a local residence that served as a clinic, school, and church. Together with other missionaries, he made 18 evangelizing tours in the Jiangsu and Zhejiang provinces, simultaneously providing medical services and preaching. Unlike many other Westerners of the time, Taylor adopted Chinese clothing, ate Chinese food, and even shaved his forehead, leaving only a pigtail. He had no hesitations whatsoever in approaching locals. This type of behavior brought Taylor a lot of trouble, because at the time these Western missionaries were British. We know that the British were all about gentlemanship, their culture, their clothing, their appearance, they had a system. Dressing like this is gentlemanly, dressing like that isn't. So when Taylor started wearing Chinese clothes, especially after he shaved his head and styled his hair in a pigtail, the foreigners could not stand it. They would say, why would a normal person choose to style their hair in a pigtail? We can't stand it. So when Taylor started dating Maria, he ran into some great difficulties. Maria's guardian at the time, Aldersey, who was a really great missionary in her own right, was completely against it. So we see Aldersey is clearly a missionary who deeply loved China. She founded a school. She especially focused on education for girls. In China, she had a huge contribution, but she was against Maria and Hudson Taylor being together. She felt Taylor was forgetting his roots. He was forgetting our British dignity, our British pride, these British things. Later, Taylor would establish provisions that all missionaries that were part of the China Inland Mission would have to wear Chinese clothes and style their hair in pigtails. For this reason, some people left the China Inland Mission. Taylor said, it is not their denationalization, but their Christianization that we seek. We wish to see Christian Chinese, true Christians, but with all true Chinese in every sense of the word. This was the time of both the Taiping Rebellion and the Dagger Society, a difficult time of chaotic war and spreading epidemics. In 1858, Taylor lost his first child and his sister-in-law. The wife of his colleague, Parker, also died of illness. From Morrison to Taylor, out of the 200-some missionaries who came to China, 40 missionaries and 51 wives died of illness. For a missionary entering inland China at the time, the average life expectancy was only seven years. In 1860, Taylor's church in Ningbo had 21 people, but he fell ill, was extremely weak, and had to return to England for treatment. And let's face it, I mean, Hudson Taylor had some pretty difficult times. I mean, he had basically, as I understand it, what we would probably call a nervous breakdown at one stage. On several occasions, his health was very poor, he lost his wife, and then, of course, there was the terrible shock of, you know, 
workers he called out on the field dying in a dif disease or different circumstances. So he knew suffering at a very deep level. But through it all, he also knew the Lord was with him. So I think his faith was very deep, very real. In England, he would often pull out a Chinese map to pray for places where he had served and also pray for the 11 inland provinces where the gospel had not yet reached. One day in 1865, Taylor was at a large gathering of a thousand people in Brighton. Before his eyes, he saw one joyful British smile after another, while in his heart he was reflecting on one hungering Chinese face after another. He prayed silently for God to send 24 willing, skillful laborers to inland China, two for each of the 11 provinces plus Mongolia. The next day, Taylor opened a bank account for the China Inland Mission in London and deposited 10 pounds. He said, this is not simply 10 pounds, but 10 pounds and all the promises of God. In September 1866, Taylor, along with 16 other missionaries in the China Inland Mission, arrived in China. They established their headquarters in Hangzhou at one new lane. The following year, Taylor appointed a Chinese pastor, Wang Laijun, to take charge of the church in Hangzhou. Taylor himself led a group of missionaries that set out for the 11 inland provinces. For the next 20 years, 137 missionaries came to China through the China Inland Mission, establishing 45 churches, 141 mission stations, and baptizing 1,764 people. At the same time, all major Christian denominations sent people to China. By 1894, 1,324 missionaries had gone to China. Especially noteworthy, in 1885, seven students from Cambridge University and the Royal Military Academy came to China, often referred to as the Cambridge Seven. They went deep into places such as Shanxi, Sichuan, Gansu, and Tibet to improve education and spread the gospel dedicating their youth to China. By the early 20th century, missionaries had traversed every province in China. They brought not only the gospel to all the places they went, but also music, culture, education, health care, charity, and more. Although the missionaries did indeed come to China with love, they also did have to enter by means of force, coming in through the openings that had been created by war and international conflicts. The misunderstandings brought about by suspicion, hostility, and cultural differences eventually caused the Chinese to slowly turn their anger toward the missionaries. Anti-Christian activities began occurring frequently across China in what were called missionary incidents, eventually culminating in the Boxer Rebellion that shocked the world. In the summer of 1900, with the slogan of support the Qing, destroy the foreigners, from Shandong and Shanxi to Hunan and Zhujiang, the boxers massacred 241 Western missionaries and over 30,000 Chinese Christians.
nearly 10,000 residential homes were burnt in Beijing. The Japanese and German ambassadors were assassinated. On June 20th, the Empress Dowager Qi Shi ordered for the attack on embassies in the legation quarter. On the 21st, Qi Shi declared war against all foreign powers. Japan, the British Empire, the United States, France, Russia, Germany, Austria-Hungary, and Italy formed the Eight-Nation Alliance and with a combined force of around 60,000 soldiers captured Tianjin and occupied Beijing. The Qin government was forced to sign the humiliating Boxer Protocol. At this brutal time, the Western missionaries behaved starkly different from their governments. They were loyal to the one who had called them to China, the Lord Jesus Christ. They did not hate, did not resist, and did not even complain. Reverend Karl Lundberg, who was martyred in Inner Mongolia, wrote in one of his last letters, We do not want to die with weapons in our hands. If God permits, they may take our lives. Reverend Horace Pitkin, a Yale graduate who was martyred in Baodin, Hua Bay, wrote a letter to his wife, which he buried beneath the church. Tell the mother of little Horace to tell Horace that his father's last wish was that when he is 25 years of age, he should come to China as a missionary. Before she was martyred, the 28-year-old Annie Eldred wrote in a letter to her family, I do love the people so, and want to stay with them. But I will leave it all to God, and gladly say, Thy will be done. During the missionary incidents, 13 missionaries and five children from Oberlin College were martyred in Shanxi. One of them, Elizabeth Atwater, wrote a letter of farewell to her family. I do not regret coming to China, but I am sorry I have done so little. I send my love to you all, the dear friends who remember me. During the Boxer Rebellion, 58 missionaries and 21 children from the China Inland Mission were martyred. Hudson Taylor was in Switzerland recovering from illness, and upon hearing this news, he was stricken with grief and almost inconsolable. He wrote, I cannot read, I cannot think, I cannot even pray, but I can trust. According to the terms set forth in the Boxer Protocol, the Qing government was to provide large sums of money as compensation. Taylor, on behalf of the China Inland Mission, renounced any claims to compensation. Under the treaty arrangements with the Qing Empress Cixi, uh, many countries claimed money. Hudson Taylor said, no, we are here for Christ, we know the risk. We knew when we came out to China that there was a possibility of this happening. We do not want to claim one cent from the Chinese government. So no money was given to the CIM at all after the uh, Boxer Uprising. And I think God honoured that because it drew a line between the Western imperialist powers and the cause of the gospel, which otherwise would have been blurred. This statement shocked the world and brought forth an even stronger wave of missions. 
Seven years after the Boxer Rebellion, the number of missionaries in China had increased to 3,833 people. In 1905, Taylor passed away in Changsha. He entered China at the age of 21 and served in China for 56 years. Alongside him, his wife and four children lay sleeping in their beloved land. His descendants, generation after generation, through a long chain of life, continue to fulfill one of his promises. If I had a thousand pounds, China should have it. If I had a thousand lives, China should have them. No, not China, but Christ. Can we do too much for him? Can we do enough for such a precious Savior? Taylor's autobiography was published by the Beijing People's Daily Press entitled, To China with Love. This is a wonderful title. What is love? Loving life, loving every single person. Obviously, as long as Christianity still appeared to the Chinese as a foreign religion, there would be no way for it to take root in China. Taylor had said long ago that missionaries should be like scaffolding and dispensed with once the house is complete. The Chinese often say foreign religion, foreign religion. The use of foreign religion as a description already demonstrates that they reject Christianity as a religion from the West. But it is not simply just a problem with the source, it is also its appearance, its content, everything Western. And this creates an extremely large cultural barrier, one that they cannot cross, right? So I think the missionaries were also thinking about how to localize. They were always thinking about these things. They ultimately hoped for the gospel to take root in China, hoped to cultivate local believers and local evangelists. In 1918, under the leadership of Calvin Matier and Chauncey Goodrich, after 28 years of translation, the Chinese Union version of the Bible that is still in use today was published. In 1907, 100 years after Morrison arrived in China, various Protestant denominations convened in Shanghai for China Centenary Mission Conference. They reached a consensus that China must build self-governing, self-propagating, self-sufficient local churches. Foreigners should gradually remove themselves from the affairs of the Chinese churches. If the blood of the missionaries were the grains of the church, then only when the grains died could the ground bear multitudes of seeds. History is no coincidence. Through the blood of the martyred missionaries of 1900, some babies were born, babies who would later become leaders of the local Chinese church. They were Wang Mingdao, Yang Xiaotang, Sun Shangzhi, Ji Juwen, Ni Ta Xiang, after the Boxer Rebellion, theologian Jia Yu Ming, evangelist Wang Zai, Bread of Life Christian Church Zhao Shi Guang, Chinese for Christ Church Zhao Jun Ying, Jesus Family Church Jing Dian Ying, and many other local evangelists grew into maturity. Worship songs composed of both Chinese melodies and Chinese lyrics also became widespread. La, 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 la. 
once came across a song that early home churches sang called Missing You, My Fellow Holy Spirit. The lyrics were really strange. Missing you, my fellow Holy Spirit. Tears are falling down. When you woke up this morning, did you read the Bible? Did you pray? It just didn't seem like a hymn or a typical worship song to me, right? Later, I realized that Christian symbolism of hymns had stuck in my mind. So I thought that these songs must have holy, holy, holy to be true songs of worship. But then I realized these songs were being sung in rural Chinese villages, expressing the suffering in their hearts, a feeling of being separated from their brothers and sisters and not being able to greet each other. No wonder they would cry as they were singing. Once I shed myself of my decades of Christian experience and really delve deep in there, I suddenly discovered, wow, it is a completely different feeling. If I sing this, I would cry too. That was really getting inside. Localization of language, localization of comprehension, and localization of emotions, together, like the Yangtze and Yellow Rivers, surged through China forming a new local climate. In 1937, the Second Sino-Japanese War began. 1,200 Western missionaries were held prisoner by the Japanese military in the Wei Xian internment camp. By 1945, when the Japanese surrendered, there were only 600 left. After 1952, all were evacuated from China. God is in charge of everything all of history. It is his story. It's all God's history. So some things, when they happen in some period and we try to reason it out, we can't because we're very much limited and God transcends our reason. These things need to be looked back on. We can look back many years later and suddenly realize this was the underlying reason. The expulsion of missionaries, we can't look at it from a negative point of view. Because of these events, the Chinese church was also forced to consider questions of localization. The seeds have already died, leaving behind an abundance of fruit. God let them go, leaving behind the triumph of their lives, their love in full bloom, the number of Chinese Christians has been growing like a miracle. In 1834, when Morrison died, there were only 10. In 1906, one century after Morrison arrived in China, there were 170,000. Today, two centuries after Morrison's arrival, there are tens of millions of Chinese Christians. Christianity in China will never be like the shadow that passed through the Tang Dynasty or the wind that blew through the Ming and Qing Dynasties because it has become a faith for the Chinese people. As we welcome the future with confidence, we must not forget the blood that the missionaries shed in the past. In their blood, we see God's eternal love for the Chinese people. Shall 
却深深爱着中国，在无悔中度过，将生命献给中国。他。座高山，每一条小路，也这样问过。他们是一粒粒麦子，祝福了苦难的中国。中国才有今天的春天，满山遍野的硕果。上帝的使者带着爱来到中国，高举燃烧的生活，走遍每一个角落，蓝蓝